Hello everyone, welcome back and in today's video, I will be taking up two problems related to the stored elastic potential energy in a rod due to, you know, compressive and axial stress. So the two problems are from AITS and the second problem is really good. So in this question, we have a bar as shown below, single piece of material having Young's modulus of Y. It consists of two segments of equal lengths L0 by 2 and area in the ratio of 1 is to 2. So we have to find the elastic potential energy stored under the action of the axial force F. So let's first discuss the concept behind this. So if I take a rod something like this attached to a wall whose Young's modulus is let's say y and length is l and area of cross section is let's say a and if I apply let's say an axial force of f so as you might imagine what will happen is this rod will elongate by a bit and let's say the elongation is delta now by using Hooke's law as is an elastic material right follows Hooke's law as we are talking about within elastic limits we can apply Hooke's law here so it stays the internal stress that acts as a result of this uh, axial force f which is f divided by a is equal to the Young's modulus y times a strain on the rod and the strain is a change in length by the original length which would be delta divided by l so from here what uh, if I rearrange the terms a bit I get the force expression as y a by l times delta. Now this is exactly similar to the response we obtained for a for a linear spring, right? So when we apply a force f on a spring, the elongation x and the force f is related by f equals kx. So this is also similar to that. So essentially these two problems are the same. So I can treat this rod as an equivalent spring, uh, whose equivalent spring constant, uh, if you guys compare these two equations, is y a by l. So if I treat it like that, so basically the above problem and the below problem are identical if my goal is to calculate the axial elongation. Okay, so this is how the situation is looking like. So we are applying an axial force F in this case as well. Okay guys, so the thing is what I'm going to about to do is section these, uh, the rods at these two points. Okay, let's call this as one, plane one, and let's call this as plane two. Now if I look at the part of the rod towards the right of plane one, so what I observe is a rod something like this. And at this end, obviously the force is F. So as we know that this is an equilibrium, I can say the, the internal forces acting at this part is should also add up to F and hence the stress over here, I can write it as F by A. So now if I talk about the section two over here, the diagram looks something like this. And on this side, the force is F. Again, as this is an equilibrium, the internal forces must add up to F here as well. But the difference is that the stress at this cross section uh, would be sigma divided by two a instead of sigma by a so it's actually half of what the stress was over here okay so let's say this is a rod on the right so obviously the forces over here is f and the internal forces that develop is also f we know that the this is simply a rod that is being pulled on both sides with a force of f and every point at and at each point inside the stress is the same right it's f by a okay so now we can easily write the elastic potential energy for this rod it is going to be half stress times strain this is the elastic potential energy stored per unit volume right so i have to multiply this with the volume of the rod as well so let's call the potential energy stored in the rod one as u1 so this is going to be half stress now what is the stress stress is simply f by a in this case you know i don't want to bother with the strain so what i'm going to do is i'm going to write strain as stress divided by y right because i can use Hooke's law here right so this would be simply stress squared divided by by y. Now the volume of the rod is simply going to be a multiplied by L0 by 2. So this is u1 and now let's just write down u2 as well. Now in the u2 case the stress is f by 2a. So it'll be f by 2a squared divided by y times the area is now 2a times L0 by 2. And after solving you get uh, the respective answers as these two values and now the final answer for the stored elastic potential energy is going to be u1 plus u2 and this is going to be 3 by 8 f square l naught divided by 8 a y a y so okay so now let's just also solve it with the spring method so so i can re replace this setup with two equivalent springs so the equivalent spring constant one is going to be y times 2a divided by l naught by 2 and the equivalent spring constant for this is y a divided by l naught by 2 okay so this is technically like k and 2k kept in series so that so the k equivalent in that case comes out to be two thirds of the smaller spring constant which is 2 y a upon l naught so i use the formula k1 k2 upon k1 plus k2 here so this comes out to be 4 y a upon 3 l naught okay so now i can write down the stored spring potential energy as as f square by 2k so this will be f square divided by 2 times and I'll obtain the same answer of 3 by 8 f square and from here also we obtain the same particular value okay guys so this problem is a bit more challenging because gravity is also coming into picture let's just read the problem statement first so we have a thin uniform elastic rod of natural length l area of cross section a density rho 
and Young's modulus Y, which is just completely immersed in a vertical position in a fluid of density 2 rho by applying a vertical downward force F at its top end. The rod is given to be in equilibrium. We have to find the elastic deformation energy stored in the rod. And two important uh, assumptions are given. So I'll explain these assumptions a bit later. First, let's draw a diagram. So let's say if this is a fluid surface over here, the rod is given to be completely immersed. The density of the rod is rho and the surrounding fluid has a density of two rho and we are applying an axial force of F. Okay guys, so first we can uh, find F in one step. This is going to be the buoyant force, which is two rho G L A minus the weight of the object, which is rho G L A. So this comes out to be simply rho G L times A. Now it is important to pay attention to how the fluid applies pressure on the surface of this rod guys. So fluid is going to apply pressure throughout the, apply the force on the lateral surface of the rod. But the thing is in the problem, they have mentioned to ignore the lateral strain. So we don't have to consider change in the lateral length of the rod. Okay, all we have to care about is how the axial length is changing. So axially speaking, the forces are only applied at the top surface and the bottom surface and also the weight of the rod, right? Uh, at, the, at the bottom surface, the force is actually 2 rho GL, which is the pressure at the bottom, which is the gauge pressure at the bottom. Now again, guys, we, they mentioned to ignore atmospheric pressure again. So we're going to be doing that. So the pressure is going to be 2 rho GL and we have to multiply it with the cross-sectional area A. So this is a technically just 2F. Now the weight of the rod uh, is going to be F for the rod to be in equilibrium. So directly we can see that the stress is going to be compressive, right? So the length of the rod is going to shrink and that's why they're asking the elastic deformation energy. Okay, so firstly, the problem causer in this problem is, is gravity because um, as a result of gravity, I'm going to be proving in a bit that the stress on different sections is going to be different. So in the last question, it was easy because the stress in, you know, in the first rod and the second rod, they remain constant, but here it's going to differ. So let's say I section the rod at some point over here, uh, that is at a distance of Y from the free surface of the fluid. And let's say I observe the FBD of this part. Obviously we'll have the force F, then we'll have the internal compressive forces uh, due to the other part of the rod. And let's call this force as F dash. And then we'll also have the weight of this part. Okay, which is going to be, so now we'll do a force balance equation. So, so I can get F dash equals F plus rho AG times Y. So as you can see, the uh, internal force, internal compressive force, it increases in magnitude as we go down. And it's a maximum at Y equal to L, its value is going to be 2F. So with that, we can also see that as we go down further and further, the compression in each of the small DL lengths of the rod is going to be more and more. So if I take a small element over here, let's call it as DY. So obviously this DY is going to get compressed as well. But as the Y increases, the DY will also increase. That's what I'm saying. Okay, so the compression at this section is going to be greater because the compressive stress is greater. So again, this is clearly varying, right? So we have to take the help of integration here. So we are going to use the formula that we used in the previous page and that was the potential energy per unit volume was equal to the half stress strain, which I also wrote it as stress squared divided by 2y. Okay, yeah, we didn't write the internal stress. So sigma, which is going to be a function of y is going to be f plus rho ag, rho ag y divided by the cross-sectional area a. Okay, so now let's zoom in into this dy element over here. So now we know that compressive stresses are acting on either side of this dy element. And we know that as a result of that, the length of this dy element is going to decrease. And let's say the reduction in length is going to be d delta. So as a result of this compressive stress, I'm saying the change in length is d delta. Okay. Now guys, they could have also asked what is the elongation in the rod. Okay, I'll first explain how to do that problem. So in that case, what you will do is uh, use Hooke's law. So we know the compressive stress uh, that is acting at these two points, right? We are, again, guys, we are taking the element so small that we can neglect the weight of this element, okay? So the compressive stress, which is, we, we know it is sigma y, right? It is equal to y times the strain. And the strain in this element is the change in length d delta divided by the original length dy. So now you're gonna separate the variables and integrate throughout the rod and you can get the total elongation in the rod. But this isn't the question here. So we are not gonna, we're just gonna ignore that. So now let's write down the potential energy change in our small element. So that is going to be half stress squared divided by the Young's modulus. This was per unit volume. So we have to multiply it with the volume of our small element, which is a dy. So now uh, you guys might have guessed it. We are going to integrate this expression. So uh, I'm gonna substitute F as rho g l a. So I can take rho a g common as you can see and I obtain this particular expression over here. So I'm gonna integrate it from zero to L. So this is going to be one plus y by L cubed divided by three 
Now we have to multiply it with a 1 by L as well and the limits go from 0 to L. So this is going to be our final answer. So yeah, that's it for this video guys. If you enjoyed the video, do like, share and subscribe. And that's it. Thanks for watching.